to, um, I'm going to click mute all after I let everybody in, but then you can um, unmute yourself as you do. Yep. So uh, I'm going to do that too. Hey, everybody. Thanks for uh, joining us tonight. Um, we're going to get going in a minute's time here. So uh, thanks for your patience. Uh, funny little story. Um, we're, we're so used to doing most of these tastings at uh, uh, eight o'clock as opposed to seven. And I don't even remember, we had a good reason at the time for why we would do this one at 7 p.m. And as I was saying to Kurt, um, my phone and watch reminded me um, approximately 40 minutes ago while washing my truck that uh, we had a tasting starting at seven. So apologies for the the little delay there, but we're going to get rolling here right away. Um, and what do I need to do here? I need to, I've got the Facebook going, I need to hit record. So if you didn't hear that, we're recording the tasting. Um, you'll note that uh, everybody has been set to um, mute, um, except for myself and my co-host Kurt Robinson from Kensington Wine Market. For those who don't know me, I'm Andrew Ferguson. I'm the owner of Kensington Wine Market and the egotistical person who named this tasting after himself. Um, in all uh, seriousness, this is really more just about kind of how we approach tastings, which is not always from a commercial standpoint. In fact, um, looking at what we're trying tonight, I think we, we only have bottles of maybe three of them to actually sell. Um, but our tastings, and, and I think some of our best ones, Kurt, you may agree, are the ones where it's like, well, we wanna try that. We don't wanna just sell it all because that's no fun. I mean, it's great that people buy it and put it in their collections or hang on to it and put it up for auction, but it's kind of fun when we get to try some of those whiskeys. And uh, I mean, if, if a whiskey tastes good and no one tries it, is it actually good, Kurt? <laughs> I think we saw that in our last tasting, right? Where we opened the two bottles of Springbank 25 we got, and I think it was a pretty, uh, a pretty warm reception we got to that concept, so. Yeah. I mean, those were literally the only two bottles we received and yeah. I stand behind that decision. It also solved another problem, which was we only had two bottles and no matter who we picked, there would have been angry people that didn't get bottles. So this way, 80-ish people got to try them. Um, so there you go, that's fun. Um, all right, line up for tonight, ladies and gents. Um, and Kurt, I might impose on you to type this out now that we've got most of our intended audience in. Um, but we're going to start off with the XOP Black North of Scotland, the grain. We're then going to do the XOP Black Tianinic 45-year-old, the 1975. The Aaron 25-year-old will be whiskey number three. Uh, the Johnny Walker Bicentennial Blend will be four. Then we'll move on to the XOP Black Glenrothes 1989. The Rosebank 30-year, which stunned Kurt um, again helping me get to a point where we could launch this tasting successfully. It kept getting bumped back further and further and further because of how big and spicy it is. So I'm excited to try that. And then we're gonna end with a Port Ellen, which is something I used to say a lot 10 years ago, not so much in recent years. There's just not a lot of Port Ellen and it's frankly atrociously expensive um, nowadays. So um, that's our lineup for tonight. I'm pretty excited about it. I mean, this is a lineup that we were all looking forward to. I know our colleague Evan was also really looking forward to it, but unfortunately he's not able to join us tonight. Um, fortunately, his samples have been protected at the shop, so he'll get to try them uh, just as soon as he gets a chance. Um, for the two new people who've just joined us, um, I have put the order uh, that Kurt typed out earlier back into the chat there so you can uh, see where we're going with this. I like to pour mine out ahead of time, uh, partly because they're gonna open up in the glass and evolve, um, and partly just so that I don't have to fumble with the bottles or the, the, the tamper-proof seals when we get rolling. Uh, so if you have enough glasses, I encourage you to do that too. Having a glass of water on the side doesn't hurt. Um, and uh, there was one other thing I was gonna say before we get rolling on this. Must not have been important. So- uh, Did you say fried right home? I, I did, and in, in a in a, freshly cleaned truck. Um, so I'm proud to say my, my truck is, uh, is, is in fine fettle. 
um, at the moment. Um, but Kurt, uh, North of Scotland, this is a whiskey we've not had a ton of at the shop. I know we had a semi-official release because I believe the, the guys who own the whiskey exchange um, bought essentially, I think, a big chunk of what was left of the north of Scotland grain. And, and most of this goes back to the 60s and 70s. And they bottled a 50-year-old a couple of years back. This is an independent bottling. But it, it, you know, at one point, I think it was a rather large grain distillery, but it's been um, closed for some time now. Yeah, I think it's turned more into a brand than anything. I think they're still bottling under the name. And I can't remember mm -hmm. the son's name of the founder, but uh, I think he's the one now in charge of it. But mm -hmm. the distillate, you're right, that you know that 50-year-old previous edition we had in that big piano black box and everything. Um, that one, it took a while to sell and it was kind of hard to understand when it was like, as you said, it was an official bottling with a 50-year age statement. I was dying to try that bottle and I almost pulled the trigger a couple of times and Mm -hmm. unfortunately i didn't and it did sell eventually but uh well, i think what i think we are going to get some back because unlike say this bottle which is a single cask when it's gone it's gone and unfortunately we're, we're trying to get more of this one i know we have a customer out in, in victoria who's desperate for a bottle of it um but we only received three bottles of this again this comes back to that idea of how good a business decision is it to open something when you only get three bottles but again, uh, we haven't seen like this, this many of these XOP black whiskeys for a while. And I was just tempted to try them. And my only regret was I really wanted to include that Port Ellen 40 year old as well, but uh, that would have dramatically increased the price of this tasting. It, in fact, it would have almost doubled the price of this tasting. So um, we had to draw the line somewhere. So 40.7%, perilously low to no longer legally being whiskey anymore. This was matured 50 years in a refill sherry, but um, bottled at 40.7%. And that's kind of an interesting point to draw on because um, I didn't realize this until about four or five years ago, but you lose about one to 2% of alcohol, or you can lose up to one or 2% of alcohol between disgorging the cask, running it through the filtration system and bottling it which is crazy. I mean, if you have a whiskey at 41%, potentially it could no longer be legally whiskey by the time it reaches the bottle. So it's kind of dangerous to leave some of these casks at that low level. Um, what do you get on the nose here, Kurt? It's, um, I love that it's refill sherry on this one. Nothing happened or anything. It's been kind of restrained, obviously, if it's lasted this long in sherry. Um, but you're almost nudging it to malt territory. It's grain, you can tell it's grain, but there's a lot of fruits that are, I would find a little bit more prevalent in, uh, you know, maybe a third fill bourbon barrel with this kind of age on it or something close to this kind of age. You really know, Kurt, it's funny you say that because you know what this reminds me the most of on the nose? Did you ever try that Gordon McPhail Long Pond 19, it was either a 1941 or a 1942 rum? It, it, it reminds me of that. It was a 58 year old bottle of rum from way back when. And it had this big note of, it was both spearmint, but then also like linseed oil. And I'm kind of seeing, I mean, I'm not saying these two are the same, but where mm. you're going with that is like, someone could pour this to me blind and I would struggle to identify that it was a, that it was a single grain. I might, my brain might be tempted to think that, oh, maybe this is just a slightly unusual bottle of cognac, an old bottle of cognac or like a slightly unusual rum. Like, that's I think that's the, when some of these spirits get so old and now after 50 years, most of what's in the glass is that character that's been pulled from the wood and that oxidation in the wood, you can kind of lose some of that original spirit character. You want to hear something crazy? That that 41 Long Pond, 1941 yeah. Long Pond, I still have a bottle upstairs that's got about this much in it. Yeah. Crazy. It, it, it was a wacky, wacky rum. <laughs> um to, to say the least and i remember when we had it it wasn't atrociously expensive but it less wasn't cheap yeah it was less than a grand and like people just you know even people who loved rum they just couldn't wrap their head around it but made during the war it was kind of mental um so tasting out here those things right like well, yeah. when we get a group of people and i can't stop smiling with a lineup like this we got a group of people here that are sitting around drinking 50 year old whiskey or 30 year old whiskey and stuff mm -hmm. 
as like our opening drama of the night is a 50 year old that's a pretty amazing night it's it's a good starting point i think you know it's uh setting the tone off on the on the right level um the palette on this same thing like i can knowing that it's a grain it makes sense it makes sense that this is grain whiskey but i think i would honestly really struggle to if i was just pull, poured this blind told it could be any kind of spirit in the world i would really struggle to pull out that this was grain um peter here or paul parson rather here in calgary said can sweet black cherries for him and syrup on the nose um, I'm getting, you know, a mix of, I mentioned that before, um, a little bit of linseed oil, not surprising you're going to get some woody, oaky characters given how old this is, but I'm also getting um, like old leather sofas, it's going into kind of tobacco tones and chocolate, and the sherry's not overly active, this is a refill butt, but 50 years in there is a long time, and, you know, it's interesting how close the flavor profiles of a malt and a grain can get after 50 years in the barrel. I also get a little bit of like um, sunflower seed, like the outside shell of sunflower seed on the palate and take some of you guys back into we're all old enough here. I get something on the palate too that's, you mentioned the woodiness. It's like chewing on one of those old yellow HP pencils in school. It's like throwback experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it does have, and you know, this, I use this quite a bit, but not often with grains. It does have that antique profile to it that just the second you knows it, the second it hits your tongue, you know it's old. That it, you don't know how old, but you just you can tell this is something that's got some age on it. Um, Aaron saying, I'm I'm not sure what the st stunning Disney for connoisseurs. Maybe that's the tasting of uh, a reference to it, but if so, that's that's great. Um, and it's uh Paul's also saying Dictador on the palate. I'm assuming he means Dictador rum uh, on the palate. Some of those ones like the, uh, that, the, the extra old series, they have the Insolent and the Perpetual. And I forget which one it was, but the Perpetual one was like, it must have been a virgin wood or the, I think they intentionally sort of burnt sugar onto the cask to create that profile. I can sort of see where he's going on this because it, it is quite decadent. Nice spices, nice starter. I'll share the link here with you. Now, for anyone who's disappointed because you really love this and you really wish you could get a bottle, and if you're not already aware of the, the price on this, I'm gonna um, copy the link on our website to it. It's currently flagged as pre-order, but um, we're not entirely sure we can get more of it. If we can, um, we'll follow up with anyone who's interested, but um, we are expecting, I believe, a 50-year-old grain, uh, also north of Scotland, from uh, Boutique Whiskey next month. Do you remember that? Was that in our, do you remember seeing that in our allocation, Kurt? I didn't, I don't remember seeing it. I do remember seeing the name, but I can't remember if I saw it as something that's available. Yet or what. Yeah, I just, I have this vague recollection that uh, we have something more coming in. So there may be another one another chance at it or something similar. Um, what I'm starting to learn and realize is that a lot of independent bottlers get offered the same parcel of casks and maybe they don't always release them at the exact same time, um, but you see similarities. And we're starting to see that right now with Capradonic. We had a Capradonic from the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society. We have one from the Boutique Whiskey Company. Um, we were just offered one. Um, we've got one coming in from La Maison de Whiskey um so i mean and they're all around that 20 year age so probably the supply of these is consistent from different companies but it wouldn't surprise me that maybe um douglas lang got a parcel of north of scotland just the same as um the boutique whiskey company and others did um i'm just quickly looking at it i see an invergordon 50 years so that's not quite the same thing but it's a 50 year old grain and at a decent price. So look, keep an eye out for that. That'll be coming out um, sometime in the next couple of months. Jeff, Jeff uh, commenting correctly here too, that the Pete's Beast 34 and the Isle of Violets 33, both Bowmores, both from um, uh, a cognac cask finish parcel and are a fairly large one because a bunch of companies have bottled it. 
Um, and uh, yeah, you do see some of this um, with some independent bottlers that some of them seem to get access to the same interesting parcels. Um, incidentally, on that note, we've been waiting for the Pete's Beast whiskeys now for three months due to COVID, Brexit, shipping containers, now fires between BC and Alberta. They are coming um, and apparently possibly very soon, but um, no one's really sure. So if, if you're waiting on one of the new Pete's Beast releases, it's coming eventually. Um, as one of my, my colleagues said in a tasting last week, this stuff's been maturing for up to 50 years. You can wait a couple of weeks or, or months if you if you have to, to get a bottle of it. Uh, what do you think, Kurt? Should we move on to the Tianinic 1975? I've been waiting for this one since it landed in the shop. One of my favorite distilleries and this is unquestionably the oldest whiskey you've ever seen. So cool. Yeah. Um, and and I, I remember doing a bit of research at the time. Um, I seem to recall that this, this might actually be the oldest bottling of Tianinic that's ever been done. I, um, go ahead. I would believe that, yeah. I, I've never heard of anything older from Tianinic. Yeah. Um, I, I, you know, I've seen the odd thing here and there. Um, you know, there's been bottlings from older bottlings from the Whiskey Agency and Malt Barn and guys like that, but I don't think anyone's bottled anything older than that. Um, but again, let's talk about similar parcels of casks um, because I, I, I'm not sure we bought any of it, but I'm pretty sure the boutique guys had a similarly old uh, Tianinic as well. And that was something that we were looking at at one point. Um, so what can we say about this? Uh, again, just three bottles of this came into the market. Kurt was excited to try it. I was excited to try it. Um, I'm going to show the bottle here because they're, they're kind of cool. And it's sort of interesting. Hunter Lang has, or sorry, Douglas Lang. I, I got to make sure to get, keep my clan straight there. Um, the uh, Douglas Lang guys with their high-end bottles here went with glass stoppers, which is a bit of an unusual move. Um, probably some people aren't fans of it, but uh, you know, Kurt and I can both attest, and I'm sure many of you guys can too. Like there's a lot of times when you open a really old bottle, maybe something that's been sitting in your collection for a few years. And if you're not careful, careful the cork will break. Um, so I'm not sure entirely what their reasoning justifications, but they, these, this range comes with glass stoppers in them. Um, they are easier to open than they at first appear. Don't just try tugging on it like a cork. You kind of have to nick it up first, just shift the position and then it pops off. But this is the XOP Black um, Tianinic 1975, matured 45 years in a hogshead. Um, I guess we're gonna find out whether we think this was a sherry hogshead or an ex-bourbon hogshead, bottled at 41.6. So again, it's dropped down a lot. You know, I think what we can expect here is hopefully like some tropical fruits starting to come out of it because this is, uh, this is a cask that's been maturing in a hoggy for, for a long time. So we got Impression? three, right? We, we got, only received three, yeah. And we yeah, cracked one. I think you sold one. We cracked this one. Mm -hmm. And then I, I think I might have told you, but we had a lovely, lovely lady come into the store looking for a gift for her, her partner. And uh, she was looking to spend somewhere around this. Not a cheap bottle, but... Uh, I was like, that's the one I want the most. She goes, tell me why. So I kind of explained why I was passionate about it. She goes, yeah, but more importantly, it's going to be a great gift for my husband because it's got a big P on it. And my name's Pam or whatever it was. And it's 1975, which is my birth year. So it's a great gift for him. <laughs> so I was a little confused by that one, but I can't, I can't lie. Letting her take that bottle was like, man, he's got a great gift coming, but I can't tell you how jealous I was and, I was eyeing that bottle and I waited it hurt. too long. <laughs> it hurt just a little bit. It did. Is what you're saying. Yeah. I mean, I'm glad it got a good home. And, you know, hopefully in a home like that too, it'll be appreciated. It'll be someone who's going to crack that bottle open and drink it um, because they can. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's funny. We've had fancy bottles go out for even you know, more tenuous reasons than that. So um, that's funny though. Um, nose, Kurt, what do you think of the aromas on this? Mandarin, 
in oh. like a little bit of like an old brandy or something. There's like old dough notes. You talk about that old whiskey smell where you just know it's old. Mm -hmm. I, I used to write it on my website sometimes. There's something, it's almost impossible to nail down with words. I just called it OWA or old whiskey aroma. It's got that like, you can tell it's got decades to it. I love that soft creaminess that's there. Almost like you've just taken the marzipan off the top of a fruit cake. Mm -hmm. I would think it's ex-bourbon. Yeah. I'm, I'm leaning in that direction too. Like for me, it's just a tropical fruit bomb, like mm -hmm. mango, papaya. There's a nice peppery spice in there as well too. Uh, like kiwi fruit. Like I'm just getting a whole bunch of, you know, bright, exotic, sweet fruit tones from it. It's so soft. You move into this really nice, subtle, um, like fancy Italian leather, um, a bit of dark chocolate, like not a ton of it, but there's just a, it's like little shavings of dark chocolate coming off of it as well too. You know, it's very possible. It's like, uh, if it's not bourbon, it could be third fill sherry or something. Sherry influence, not aggressive by any means if it is sherry. I honestly can't tell on this one. It could be, Amer I mean, the other thing too, is it could be American oak sherry, right? Like yep. we, when we say sherry, we're generally um, oversimplifying. And, and the reality is there's both American oak and European oak sherry casks. But you're right, if this is second or third fill and it's an American oak sherry hoggy, you wouldn't expect to get much sherry character off of it. Um, but yeah, this is just, it's soft, it's subtle. Um, uh, some of those fruits are there. I think you can start to see some of the age creeping in on the palate, like it's drying out a little bit. It's getting a bit on the, I don't want to say tannic side, but it's it's starting to go into that direction. Um, yeah. You've moved kind of, there's still some orange tones there, I think, but they're almost like when you've got a lot of like the pith on the orange, like the white skin on it, it kind of dries out the mouth a little bit. Mm -hmm. Still kind of tropical, but you're right. It's kind of like the tropical notes are in at the distance at this point. Mm -hmm. And you're, you're the, you were really starting to see spicy tones, like some musty old oak, like again, things that imply age, um, for me, like some nice cigar tobacco on the palate as well too. Nothing too heavy, like a nice light, sweet kind of cigar tobacco, but some nice layers to it. It's a lovely whiskey. You know, this is one of those ones where I hate to be that guy, but like I would have loved to have seen this taken out of the barrel at like 35 or 40 years of age and wonder how much more expressive it might've been, um, you know, without that little bit of extra time in the cask. Yeah, it's a little long in the tooth for sure. Uh, I think I hope for a little bit more on the palate, but I'm, mm -hmm. I am not complaining. It's at least pouring me that. And if that bottle was still available, I think I still want it. Mm -hmm. um, Paul and Roy, our friends here in Calgary, uh, said they compared it to the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society bottle. This ain't no pissy, pussy cat, saying it's directionally very similar. Sky Andrews in uh, Vancouver, oranges, Jess um to the north i'm i'm assuming that's uh, a reference to something earlier on that i didn't quite catch um but the the bottle that paul and roy are talking about 59.58 i believe that's a bladnock and um a uh you know some of those society bladnocks we had were, were lovely uh it's one of, that's one of those distilleries that for me is incredibly hit or miss but when it hits it's just a dynamite excellent excellent dram well Let's leave that TNNIC to the side for a moment here. Um, we will uh, revisit it. Uh, I encourage people, if you can, to leave a little bit of each of them in your glass as we go through them tonight. That'll give you an opportunity to uh, uh, go back and, and check in on the whiskeys, see how they evolve over time, um, because they do change in the glass. But not only that, your, change of, your perception of taste is going to change over the course of the tasting as well. Um, I'm just going to share the link uh, to that Tianinic. I, I, I'm pretty sure I shared in the north of Scotland. I don't think I've shared this one yet. So I'll fire that into the chat. And then we are going to move on to something I am extremely excited to try um, because uh, I'm a huge fan of the distillery. We're on to the Aaron 25 year old. Um, I've been a fan of Aaron for as long as I've been in the industry. I, I've been in the industry now for uh, almost 18 years. Um, I remember when Aaron first launched, um, 
even their young whiskeys, they had this young, uh, no age statement whiskey, probably under five years of age. Uh, I remember just being enthralled by the distillery uh, when I visited for the first time. I think they've, they've, they had whiskey by that point of about eight, nine years of age. And I've just been following it ever since. And uh, it's been fun to kind of watch them hit 10 years of age, 15 years, of, well, 14 was, I guess, what they did for their core range. Uh, but 14, 18, 21, and now 25 years. Um, it's been a really cool journey to follow along on. And this is, I believe, produced from whiskey distilled in their, their, their first full year, their second year of production, 1996. And uh, I've had some incredible whiskeys from that particular year. Sorry, this was distilled in 95, um, not in 96, but it's of the oldest stock they have. They've only done one release so far. I'm hoping that they'll do another one this year. Um, we've been bottling casks of their whiskey now for more than a decade. It's a huge hit in, in, in the shop. And uh, predominantly sherry matured. What do we got here? We've got 35% uh, sherry, sorry, and 65% ex bourbon. It was then married and finished for 12 months in first fill and refill sherry hogsheads. So all of the whiskey was matured, um, well, partial, th one third into sherry, two thirds in bourbon, but then finished for a full year, married. I, I, you, maybe we could say married rather than finished because it spent, that was that period where after they'd put it all together and blend it, they put it back into casks. And uh, what have we got, Kurt? Sherry twists those candy cherry twists things. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of the new school of sherry, a little bit more mm -hmm. spice driven than jam driven, even though there's still a lot of like red fruits and apples and stuff like that. Um, mm -hmm. I think the apple side is probably coming from the bourbon. I typically associate with like a little bit of cinnamon and stuff, but it's the sherry that's driving this one being a smaller percentage there. Yeah. I, you can kind of see those both out, both those elements in there. You can see that creamy vanilla, the honey, that base that's coming from that big portion of ex-bourbon. But like you said, um, some of those red fruit, I'm getting like uh, like red red licorice nibs or whatever, or like strawberry nibs, um, those red shoelace kind of, can't those ropey candies. But it's also moving into like cooked raisins, dates, chocolate as well. So I'm getting some of those other elements too. But yeah, this is definitely... I don't know. For me, I'm on the fence. This is kind of somewhere between new, new school and old school sherry. It's a very new school style of whiskey, I would argue, where it seems almost less on the real fruits and more on candy notes and stuff like that. Mm. It's so vibrant, though, on the nose. Mm -hmm. I think when you get to the palate, it does have a bit more of a traditional feel to it. Um, yeah, I and mean, can still see where you're going there. I can get a bit of like a strawberry shortcake like sweetness coming off of it with the strawberries, the sugar, the cream and the cake. Um, but I've still got that nice um, gentle leather, earthy tobacco um, and dark fruit kind of element coming in as well. A little bit of a walnutty note or something coming now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, it's kind of drying on the palate. Yeah, yeah I can feel the tannins gripping a little bit now. Mm -hmm. The second sip for me, I think starting to show a little bit more depth, a little bit more character. It's opening up a bit more on the palate. Um, yeah, I mean, this is a, this was a limited release. I don't know if I, if I recorded it on our site exactly how many bottles they did, but this was not a huge outturn. Um, uh, and, it, you know, distillery like this, it's kind of crazy to think like the, the most difficult part of starting a distillery from scratch and laying casks down is in order to pay for putting down future casks and hopefully profit from your investment, um, you know, you got to bottle whiskey. But the tricky part is not bottling so much that you don't have mature stocks at various points in the future. And I think with them, we've seen a little bit of hiccups here and there, but, um, you know, from a, a, a logistic standpoint, I think they've plotted this thing fairly well because we've continuously seen progressively older whiskeys and occasionally like I know they had to drop the 14 but they've been able to maintain that 18 year old for quite a long time the 21 year old is now a permanent release um so I mean 
you know, that, that side of starting a distillery from scratch and making whiskey, I think has, has, has panned out quite well for them. Uh, what what's that? And what a location that if you get to yeah. visit, right? Like, holy cow, it's beautiful there. The drivers are scary as hell. <laughs> <laughs> well, is that, is that what Evan told you about my driving? No, 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 no. I'm sure you were fine. We, we got upgraded to just an absolutely ridiculous Mercedes last time I was over. And uh, we, man, touching that pedal was one of the greatest things I've ever experienced in my life. I messaged the wife right away. I was like, we are buying one. Uh, a year and a half later, we still haven't. But uh, on those roads, I was just booking her. And I was having my doors blown off by locals and vans and shit. And you know how narrow some of those roads are too, right? Oh, that's good. That's it's crazy. wild. I, I actually like driving uh, over there. I love those narrow roads. It's, it's <laughs> fun. You, you got to, you got to pay attention. You got to focus. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the island is beautiful. The distillery is one of the most charming and one of the most picturesque. And they've now got a second distillery on the south side of the island, which is also worth a view and which has an incredible view from their still room. Um, it looks across towards the mainland, towards Elsa Craig, which is a little rocky island um, in between the Kintyre Peninsula, um, well, really between the island of Aran and the mainland. And it's where all the curling stones are, are, are harvested from. Um, but then on the other side, the, the building looks up island along the coast and up towards the mountain on Aran, which is the goat fell. Um, both of their distilleries are very picturesque. and. Uh, Evan and I were over there, you know, shortly after I think Kurt was uh, a year and a half ago, almost two years ago, Kurt, um, almost. if we think about it. And we got to try the spirit coming off the stills at, uh, um, at Lag, their other distillery, and it's absolutely phenomenal. Um, and I can't wait to see that come along. But I think the 25 year old first 25, it's a nice whiskey. Um, it's not like knock my socks off good but it's it's very solid good quality which i think is what we've come to expect from aaron like they rarely disappoint um we don't come across too many bad bottlings from them um aaron asking if we have this uh we do not have any of this in stock unfortunately um we were lucky to get an order of it and because somebody else somewhere in the world canceled we were lucky to get a handful more bottles but unfortunately uh it is gone. Um, the 21 year old, um, we've got Aaron and, and Claude saying that they like this better than the 21. You know, the, the current bottling of 21, I think we're not quite as happy with as the previous one. But I think where you always find good quality is the 18 is still um, like knockout when we have it, which is, again, not right now. It's one of those things that comes in and we get as much as we can and then it sells out very quickly. But it's good value. And I think you could also say that about the Aaron 25 year old for the oldest whiskey this distillery has ever put out there. If you compare it to what other companies are charging for their 25 year old and the fact that this was their first, um, 540 was a very fair price for it. And I think the best things I can say about Aaron is that their quality is great. The people there are lovely. They're a great company to work with, but their prices are, are always very fair. They've got to go up like everyone's do to a certain extent over time. But it, when they go up, they're never crazy. They're, they're always very fair and very reasonable increments. And they bottled 46. We love that too. Lots of love for Aaron. Mm -hmm. um, Benoit did ask earlier, and I didn't uh, miss that question, Benoit. Do we have an Aaron coming? And actually we do. We have a new Aaron single cask in the pipeline. Kurt, I think, asked me this the other day. He's like, do you, remember, do you know what old casts we have coming? Because we try things and I'll ask Kurt and Evan and Sean and some of the other guys for their opinion. And then we commit. And then, you know, it shows up one day and we're like, oh yeah, that's on that, that was coming. Um, it's become a bit of a self-perpetuating, you know, um, continuous motion machine. I'm not sure what that is. Perpetual motion machine that just keeps feeding itself new casks. Um, there's some really cool stuff coming. The Aaron that's coming this fall, my recollection is it was under, it was around 12, 13 years of age. It's sherried and it's lovely. Um, we were really happy with it. Um, I did notice that uh, some retailers in the UK have been bottling 24 year old casks of Aaron. And that got me uh, feeling a little bit of FOMO. So you, you never know, you might see one of those in the next year or two. 
Um, I think the oldest we've done yet was a 22. Um, but, uh, you know, we got to, we, we got to, we got to space some of these things out. We've got some other mature, interesting single casks and projects coming, including, um, we have a family cask coming next year from Glen Farkless, which, uh, we were, to be honest, I think all of us were kind of not expecting knowing what family casks go for, uh, these days that we were going to find something that we were happy with that the price we could we could live with and, and make it work as a project. But um, it's our 30th anniversary next May. And uh, that might give you a clue to um, how old this family cast might be, but we're extremely excited about it. So it's gonna be really cool. Um, so that's coming in the pipeline as well. Uh, let's talk Johnny Walker, Johnny Walker Bicentenary Edition. Um, again, because I was washing my truck and not at home, uh, preparing for tonight's tasting. I actually have very little uh, information on this whiskey, so I'm going to have to quickly pull it up on our website, Kurt, well, um, so we can talk about it. I just so happened to have opened the packaging today and taken out the little book that was in it. And oh, so. well, look at you. Um, well, look, Kurt, we're not, just, we're not just keeping you around for your, for your palate and your good looks. Um, you're adding uh, a bit more character and depth to this uh, event. Keep talking. I like where we're going here. Um, I'm going to bear with me for a minute. I'm going to read you something because I kind of think it's cool and leads into um, a little bit of the concept that went into this one. Because I, I think a lot of people, and I, this drives me kind of crazy, are really dismissive of Johnny Walker. And I kind of think it's one of the best brands in the entire whiskey world, to be honest with you. The only well, one I Kurt, is the red. I, I think I need to take some credit for doing that because I have talked some trash about Johnny Walker <laughs> over the last few years, but mainly to do with how disappointing I find the blue label now compared to say 10, 15, 20 years ago. It's been this slow decline, but we did a Johnny Walker tasting uh, last summer. We did the gold, we, well, the black, the double black, the platinum. Everything in there was brilliant except for the blue. Yeah. Um, black label. So I th yeah, the black label was great. Like it, and the black label for me, the gold, uh, they they all showed really, really well. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I I'm, I'm going to have to eat some of that. I was impressed when they came out with the the Port Allen and the Brewer editions. I thought those were really well done. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean. Uh, probably I have not given enough respect to the uh, the younger stalwarts in the Johnny Walker range. Well, I think we do have a new one in too that I think we might, well, we have two, no, just one actually, uh, that mm -hmm. we might need to use in some kind of tasting if we can get enough for it too. And that one's that legendary eight that's got some Aurora in it. Mm -hmm. Having said that, I don't know if you actually knew it. This one has some Port Ellen in it. Ooh. Well, Kurt, tell us about, I interrupted you. Tell us about the Johnny Walker uh, bicentennial blend. <laughs> I'm drinking good whiskey now. I talk a lot too. So. And it's technically, someone's corrected us. It's the bicentenary. Bicentenary. I don't know why we've got bicentennial on this, but you know, it's Kensington Wine Market. We we're good guys. We have fun. Everybody loves us. We get details wrong from time to time, and it all comes out in the wash. We drink a little bit. We yeah, uh, you know, we get paid to drink. It's, that's right. our biz. All right. Um, 200 years ago, our founder, John Walker, first opened the doors of a small grocery store in Kilmarnock that would go on to change the world of whiskey forever. The aisles were packed with the exotic ingredients that marked this rich era of exploration. Flavors and scents from all across the globe. Heisen tea from China, dark pepper from Jamaica, Italian licorice, and of course, Scotch whiskey. From their vibrant store teeming with produce, John and his son Alexander and late grandsons began their pursuit of creating whiskeys, which none could rival by bringing together whiskey from the four corners of Scotland. Um, he says, master blender Jim Beveridge and his small team of expert whiskey makers have drawn inspiration from the thrilling flavors listed on an original inventory from John Walker's store. Using this as a window into the world where John started, they have meticulously crafted a complex whiskey with rich layers that reimagines the kaleidoscope of exotic flavors that shaped our founders' imagination. It's kind of cool. You know, you're playing to the marketing and all that kind of romance and all that 
you know, cheesy shit that we kind of get sucked into. But I like the story. I thought it was cool. No, for sure. Well, I actually, I, I've, uh, I read, uh, what's his name? Uh, uh, Nicholas Morgan's book on Johnny Walker. And I mean, it's cool to, to some of the, the stories behind these brands and how they came about are, are quite fascinating. Mm-hmm. Um, I love the connection between Johnny Walker and um, uh, Joseph Kennedy, John F. Kennedy's father, and this murky deal that he did at the end, towards the end of prohibition to flood the US with Johnny Walker the day prohibition ended. Um, or, you know, guys like the Dewars, the Dewars brand. I mean, there's Tommy Dewars, there's some fascinating tales in there. But can I just, can we just address for one moment how appropriate is it that Johnny Walker's master blender's name is Jim Beveridge? Like, Pretty you weird. can't make you can't make that stuff up. Like, Jim Beveridge. Ah, uh, anyway, let's let's delve into this. Um, this is a limited edition release. Um, you know, limited. They are a big company, so those terms are all relative. Um, and I will share the link here with the incorrect description of the bottle. Um, but I'll plug it into the chat here for everybody. What have we got here? It's the base of this is 28 years old. So that's the age of the youngest component in the blend. Bottled at 46%. Um, and as Kurt said, it's got a number of components. And I don't know if you mentioned these in your description, Kurt, but it's got whiskeys from three closed distilleries, Pity Vake, Cambus, and Port Ellen. Uh, are in the blend. Wow, I can't believe we're four whiskeys into a lineup like this. And right now this is my favorite bunch. That's high praise. Wow, this is a crazy one. There's a comment um, I just saw that said, this is a single malt, not a blend. The only, <laughs> the only way I would peg this as a blend is at the very end of the finish. It kind of goes into those Caramel apple notes and stuff that's a little bit safe that you always find in blends. Mm-hmm. Jeez, man. And I think the, the peat on this one, that little bit of peat that's in there is a sleeper. It's kind of like with Amrit Fusion or something, where you're like, oh, it's sugar cookies and oranges and whatever. And then there's a little bit of a leathery peat note that sneaks in at the back end. This kind of feels mm-hmm. like that to me. Yeah. This is very pretty. Um... I think where it suffers for me a little bit is on the nose. I don't find I get as much from this on the nose as the others. And that, that could be just a, um, a consequence of blending. Like you're, you're adding so many different elements together that maybe they kind of counter each other or, or balance each other out on the nose. But the palette on this is, is beautiful. Like it is, it's silky, um, fruity, complex. I, I agree with you. You'd never know this was a blender that there was grain in it until you get towards the back end of the palate. And I think for a lot of people, they would never even pick up on that unless you told them. Yeah, that's neat. This, so that north of Scotland was super cool in so many ways. That tea and in it going back to it, all those tropical notes, it's kind of going a little bit fishy now I find too. Mm-hmm. Um, the air and that robustness of that cherry twist note, I love. But every one of those whiskeys to me was missing something, or they had that great characteristic of something that I wasn't really loving. I mm-hmm. kind of dig this all the way through. I like the nose, I like the palate, I like everything on this one. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I think you know what we can say for those people who maybe don't drink blends all that often or aren't familiar, but I mean, the whole concept behind blending is you can make something that's greater than any of the individual components on their own. And um, blends, that was the idea back in the day was to create something that tasted good, that people would love, that had a very complex and interesting profile to it. I think you can legitimately say that a lot of the blended whiskey companies in the late 20th century and the, the first decade or so of the 21st century sort of lost sight of this and it became a bit more about marketing than it was about the liquid. Um, but the potential for blends to be better than you know, your average single malt are there because they can draw from more components. They can pull more elements in to, to create something that's more interesting and more full of character. But I, I, I personally believe that, you know, around the, the early 2000s, a lot of the big blending companies just were, they were dialing it in. They, they felt like they didn't really need to try. They had established brands. They didn't need to innovate. 
And then along comes, you know, companies like Compass Box that start pushing the boundaries, pushing the envelope. And then in the last 10 years, what we've seen is you've seen some of these big companies respond. Um, uh, the blender, um, uh, Christy, I forget her last name, from Doers, who's been doing some really cool things with their cast selection on their blends. Like, Kurt, I know we were all huge fans of especially the 27 and the 32-year-olds they came out with um, yeah. in recent years. I think that's a direct response to the, the surge of interest in single malts, especially premium and like good quality single malts, but also some of these boutique blenders that have been, you know, sort of challenging the, the status quo of the industry and showing that they, they can do better or they can do as well at the very least. Yeah, blending to me is that thing that it's, it's a frustrating conversation because there's the two camps. There's the one that's like the Play-Doh theory where you take something like a Johnny Walker or something and you put 28 different components in it and all the highs that you would have had in there, all those bright colors, when you marry them together, they all look brown, right? It's just dulled it all down and taken away all the high points. And then you go to the other end of the spectrum, like you said, with Glazer. Glazer works like a jeweler. He picks like a brilliant malt as your center stone. And then he puts a couple of key pieces around it just to set it off a little bit. And that's the elegance of what you said. You should be able to make more than just the sum of the parts. Take something that you know is really good and elevate it a little bit. Mm -hmm. Blends can be so, Yeah, they absolutely can. And if anyone else like Kevin, our friend Kevin Marinick in Vancouver Island was confused because you couldn't see the links to the products, um, that's because for some reason, um, some of you may have noticed if you were logged on on time, I sent a note to everyone in the waiting room that uh, we would start a few minutes late. Um, well, it seems that uh, I've been sending those links to people in the waiting room of whom there are none. So um, that's a quirk about Zoom I'm only learning about tonight. So, you know, <laughs> yeah, we've, only been, we've only been doing these tastings for a year or so. And uh, I'm only just figuring, uh, figuring that, little, that little nugget out. But uh, anyway, I'm just gonna plug those into the chat here before we keep going. Yeah. And you know, what I said earlier, I certainly don't want to give anyone the impression that I'm, I'm, I, I am, or was anti blend. In fact, quite the opposite. Um, I'm a champion of, and I've, I love good blends, but I think, you know, and I needed to circle back and give some of them like the Johnny Walkers another try, but for much of the last 15 years, I really feel it's been these small blenders that have been the ones making the most compelling and interesting blends. And I think it's forced the rest of the industry to respond and to come out and, and produce better blended whiskey. And, uh, you know, I, I look forward to seeing more of that because, uh, you know, I think there's actually a lot, I think there's actually a lot of middle-aged and mature single malts that a lot of big whiskey companies don't want to admit that they have, because then they'd have to drop their prices for their 25 year old whiskeys and their 18 year old whiskeys. I'm not going to name any names, McCallum. But um, I think there's potential there for some of those components, which I'm sure are incredible to be, to be worked into blends. And maybe that'll see a, a birth in better quality blends being put out in, in the future and some more interesting one-offs. Uh, shall we go to the darkest one in our stable tonight? This is gonna be a big one. Now this yeah. one, I, I almost thought should have been second to the Port Ellen, but there's a, a note or two in the one we'll do after this that just made it seem like it had to go just before that. But this is a really, really robust whiskey that to me should be almost at the end of any run, just based on the nose alone. I haven't tasted it yet, but. Well, and, and Kurt, I think I'm speaking for both of us when I say um, this style of whiskey from this particular distillery without nosing it is one that often gives me pause. Yes that I feel it can go one of two ways. Um, it's either gonna be brilliant or it's gonna be utter rubbish. And uh, I've had both. Um, Fortunately, there's no rubbish tonight, man. This nose is awesome. Yeah. Just plugging that in there now so you can all see, this is the XOP Black Glenrothes 30 year. Um, this was 30 years in a refill sherry butt, which again, let's talk about that. Refill sherry, but that still has some color to it. 47.5%. Um, yeah, this is like st 
stewed prunes, um, dark chocolate, like those dark chocolate covered espresso beans. Sky Andrews in Vancouver is saying sherry bombs. We're sherry bomb territory here. But one of the things that you worry about sometimes with some of these whiskeys, and I, I hate to say it, but we've seen a very high proportion of heavily sherried whiskeys in particular from this distillery that have had like either a mild to a very prominent sulfur taint to them. And this has none of that. Um, but that's kind of what I worry about. When I see a really dark Glenrothes, I, that's what I mean when I say, I think I can go one of two distinct ways. And this is not that. There's some softer tones in there too. Like there's some soft fruits. Like it's quince cheap, paste, go ahead. It's always a cheat when you say like fruit cake or Christmas cake, but there's a lot mm -hmm. of here, including that when you typically get um, not just the, the body of the cake, but that layer of, you know, mm -hmm. Mars and almond paste on top. Take that creaminess and smash it together like one big experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I'm getting that fruit kind of like that fruit cake kind of tone too. I'm also getting like sticky toffee pudding and treacle sauce. Like there's this is this is big sherry, but without any of those, not just the sulfur, but really at least on the nose, without any of those sharper, rougher edges to it. Like this is sweet, fruity sherry. Some marmalade, some stuff that's into those like more tangy tropical kind of tones. Not mm -hmm. deep on the tropical, not five alive kind of territory, but like I, I do have to say, as a brief detour, I do see Dave is here with us tonight. Um, I I hope you did hear Angie, Andrew mention sticky toffee pudding again, because I know we've had that conversation a couple of times, man, and uh, I'm still waiting. Oh, does, does Dave make a great sticky toffee pudding? He absolutely does. And we had one at his place, uh, I guess, pre-COVID. Uh, it was killer, a brilliant, brilliant little dinner he put on. Um, and we keep having discussions about another sticky toffee pudding coming soon. So... <clears throat> Well, I'm in. I'm a, I'm a huge fan of sticky toffee pudding. Um, true story, Kurt, and I don't know if you knew this, but uh, um, my very first trip to Scotland, is uh, I was there for two weeks, and I discovered sticky toffee pudding. I mean, I'd had it once or twice before, but I discovered it on my first night in Scotland, and I was a train wreck. I was at Whiskey Live Glasgow. I ran into a bunch of people I knew. I stumbled off a plane. I don't even know how I found my hotel room. But for each of the, the next 13 nights, and I could do this because I was in my mid 20s at the time and not, you know, mid 40s. I had a different sticky toffee pudding from a different place every night for two weeks. And I, I at one point considered having a blog where I just blogged about sticky toffee pudding and rated the best sticky toffee pudding in Scotland. And I can tell you the best one I had on that trip, and this was the bizarre was served to me by these six foot tall blondes in a pub on, in the town of Portree on the island of Skye. Um, I later learned they were Polish because um, you don't see a lot of six foot tall, six, at least back then you didn't see a lot of six foot tall blondes wandering around Scotland. But it was this sticky toffee pudding drizzled in treacle sauce and drowning in vanilla ice cream. Um, it was incredible. I had a similar experience. It wasn't as good as yours. <laughs> it was uh, on one of my, when I take the tour groups over, I think it was probably 2016 or 2017 perhaps. And uh, we had haggis every day. We tried the haggis everywhere we went. Um, I, I think the sticky toffee put was a better idea. But if, you're, if you are going there, um, Glen Fittick, their cafe had the best haggis we had while we were there. Ah, that's, that's a, that's a good tip. That's you know, so you probably lost less years off your life from going the haggis route as opposed to the sticky toffee pudding route, but uh, you know, who knows? Um, how to develop. Exactly. <laughs> uh, so we had a quick question here about the XOP Glenrothes. Is there any left? Alas, no, this is long gone. Uh, there was only three bottles. They did not last long. We opened one of them. Um, this is one of the peculiar things about a company like Douglas Lang doing releases like this, where there's sometimes only 120 to 150 bottles, and sometimes the entire allocation for 
a market like Canada is six to nine bottles. I th and actually, I think we had six of these, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, but unfortunately, they are gone. They did not last long. And it's not hard to see why. I think there was buzz about this one before it even hit the hit the shelf at the shop. But uh, I did uh, put a new link out there for the TNN because apparently I re resent the Aaron. So apologies for that. Um, Kurt and I were joking about this tasting being, well, I was joking about it because I was under the stress of running late of it being a hot mess tonight. So from a detail standpoint, it's a bit of a hot mess, but the whiskeys are making up for it, as is the conversation. So we're not going to worry about it too much. I don't joke about these things, man. I take my job very seriously. My boss could be listening right now. <laughs> he could be, <laughs> um, but, but we digress. Um, all right, we're, we didn't plan this this way. Um, we are moving into the two most expensive bottles in tonight's tasting. Um, both single malts from closed distill, well, technically closed, but reopening distilleries. I guess with Rosebank, we could say it's reopened, but Kurt, I don't know where you, where you land on this, but I would ask, is the new Rosebank distillery still Rosebank or is it just a new distillery that they're calling Rosebank? Yeah, I Rosebank's a little bit different, but not too much. So any of the more recent closures, I want to hear the arguments in both directions. Um, the older you go back from the closures, you know, with the 80s distilleries closures and stuff, almost everything was going to be different. Not just the equipment, but the barley that was used. It was probably all Golden Promise back then or something, you know. Uh, barley strains, yeast strains, all that kind of stuff, and a consistency for casking and a, a wood policy that mattered. Rose Bank only shut down in 93. I would argue there's probably a little more control and a little bit more um, streamlining of processes that would have nailed consistency down and probably some better metrics for reopening and keeping a style consistent. Mm -hmm. But I, I lean towards, as you rightly said, this is a new distillery. You, you've been shut down for 30 years, man. Like, keep, okay, it's great. You brought it back to life. That's happened many times throughout history in the whiskey world. But let's not pretend as whiskey people that we're getting the same drink. It's not happening. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think it also brings up the other issue, which is that I don't believe they acquired all of the site when they reopened. And it's not as though the equipment was just sitting there waiting to be reused. Like, it's all new kit. From what I understand, there might be a handful of pieces that they acquired, but it's all brand new kit. And pretending that it's the same to me, I don't know. I'd like to see how the new new distillery comes out, how the whiskey is when it when it first launches. But yeah, in a way, to me, it I don't know. I, I struggle with it a little bit, and it, and it's no different. I have the same feelings to an extent with Port Ellen, maybe a little less so with Brora because. A lot of that equipment was just sitting there neglected, locked in the distillery. Um, I had a chance to go through there probably 10 years ago before they stopped letting people go in there and have a look around. Um, but yeah, it's just, I'm ex am I excited that there's a new distillery open called Rosebank? Yes. Um, but I struggle with kind of equating it as being the same. And, you know, all, to be honest, I think it'll be the same when Port Ellen opens. I'll have a hard time kind of looking at that as the same. To me, it'll be, you know, kind of like Brook Laddie bottling Port Charlotte, like one of their whiskeys is Port Charlotte. It really doesn't have that much to do with the old distillery. It's just the name. So, but we'll see. Um, now we put this whiskey in the lineup or by, by we, I mean, I put this whiskey in the lineup for a couple of reasons. One, I actually really wanted to try it because I have very fond memories of Rosebank. Um, we had some incredible bottlings of Rosebank from Gordon McPhail, especially over the years. At one point, I think we had 20, a 25 year old Rosebank come through the market here in Calgary. I had bottlings from uh, uh, Diageo's rare malt selection, you know, other independent bottlers. And it's a whiskey that I've always loved, um, but it's something we've not seen much of over the last say four or five years. Um, I think we've had one Gordon McPhail bottling come through about two years ago and that was the last time we've seen anything uh so i was excited to try it but i also had an ulterior motive we bought two of these and the pricing on these is atrocious it's atrocious not because the the company is is 
selling it for too much, but because for some reason, something got mixed up when they created their export price and our retail in Canada is effectively double what it was selling for in the UK and Europe. Um, and we have two bottles of it and I wanted to get rid of one of them. And one way to do that was in a tasting. So basically we, all we did is recover the cost from one of these bottles, but the even better part is we get to try it. Cause otherwise I don't think we would have ever had a chance to try this whiskey. And Kurt, let's talk about it. Nose, what do you get? I'm so glad this whiskey's open now. Um, I think we should use the second bottle in another tasting because this is amazing. We, we might just do that. We might just do that. <laughs> I want to drink it again and I haven't even tasted it yet. Um, to be honest with you, my favorite Rose Bank, um, the last time we were at your place when we did our staff function there, you had a heel of a bottle of Rose Bank 21, a Diageo release from 2011. And I was, you know, as we were exploring some of these bottles and stuff, as we do, uh, that whiskey wowed me that night so much. I was like, this is the best Rose Bank I've ever had. To the point where I had to go out and track one down for myself, like since then, I had to have it. I was like, I love that whiskey. That's probably my favorite Rose Bank today, even though there's been older ones. This is probably my second favorite, just based on the notes. I haven't even tasted it yet, but this note is Remember fruit leather or, or fruit roll up, sorry, from being a kid, mm -hmm. um, splashed in lemon and sugar. It almost reminds me of the lemon sugar crepes my wife makes, minus the egginess. Mm -hmm. Lots of vanilla, custardy. It's very doughy, it's floral. Um, this is a note that most of you probably won't get, but it reminds me of this very traditional Scottish dessert, dessert called Cranachan on the nose. Um, some of you might have had that before. It's a pudding. I've got nieces that live in the UK. They call everything pudding, but it's a pudding that's like boiled in the traditional method. And then I, I believe put in a cup with like berries and whipped cream. And it just, it reminds me of that on the nose. This very, very right delicate. What's that, Kurt? Right in my wheelhouse. I love this style. Yeah. So uh, this was a release um, of what is it here, 4,350 bottles. Um, the cask mix was 62% uh, refill sherry from refill sherry butts uh, and the rest from uh, refill bourbon, bourbon hogsheads, 38%. And it was bottled at a strength of 48.6%. And the palate. Yeah, the palate's got this this interesting, like creamy, sweet floral thing, but with with a really nice spiciness to it on the palate, a nice viscosity, um, and Lots the finish is just there. long and floral. Lots of that like, Hallmark Rose Bank, like lemon citrus note, some orange, some almost like a ginger spice or something. This is kind of almost underselling it, but it, it's like those orange and lemon flavored starburst fruit candies because it's waxy, it's sweet. It's not overly fruity, but those fruity tones are there. Um, but a nice base layer of vanilla in this too. And it just, it just smooth right through the finish. Yeah, this is a cool whiskey. It's a shame they charge so much for it though. If I can afford it, I'd buy it. That's a little beyond me, but I would absolutely take that. Oh, very pretty, very elegant. Um, that's the first Rose Bank I've had in two years. Um, other than, you know, something that might be in my lingering around in my basement. Um, we should check that soon. We really should. <laughs> I, it, you know, it's been a while since I've had a good rummage around the, uh, the whiskey cupboards to see what treasures lie within. And it's never um, to do that by yourself. I mean, <laughs> well, for the last year and a half, I've had to, um, you know, the, the wife at one point, uh, my, my lovely wife was uh, assisting in uh, helping finish off heels, but not from a way that she cared or was enjoying them, but she would like shoot it and then like wince um, when she did it because she was just trying to help get rid of some of the bottles. This is a true story. Um, she's, a she's a team player in her mind, but not in mine on that note. Um, yeah, Dan, 
Well, we've got two dance here in Calgary. You never know. There might be uh, there might be an opportunity to help me out with some of my uh, house cleaning, as it were, um, at some point here. Um, yeah, this is just this is a fun. I mean, it's kind of almost like this would be a cool endpoint. Like, it's a good rose bank. It's extremely well put together. Um, actually, you know what? This isn't the first rose bank I've had in two years because we had the Rosebank Grace as part of the Elixir Distillers Old and Rare Tasting a couple weeks back. And it was good, but it might give you a sense of how much better this is that I'd completely forgotten that I'd had a Rosebank not, not less than six weeks ago in a different tasting. Yeah, this one completely overshadows that one. Mm -hmm. Very pretty, very elegant. Incidentally, um, it's good to know we've got so many good cleaners here in town. Um, Incidentally, we have one bottle of, the, of this left in store, and I was going to do this regardless of how well it tasted. But um, if anyone wants the bottle, I'm happy to give you 25% off on it, which, which gets it close to being a fair price for what this whiskey is. Um, but there's only one. So if you want it, you can either email me or place it online and mention that I said there'd be a 25% discount. Um, and they'll ask me about that in the morning and they say, are you sure? And I'll say, yes, I did say that. Um, but, uh, if anyone does want one, I'm happy to do a one-time 25% discount on this because part of me has been struggling with this one. I actually got in a big fight with the importer that's still denying that they mispriced it, but they totally mispriced this. And it's frustrating because I think we, you know, we could have, we could have sold a dozen of these if it was priced the same way it was in the UK and Europe, but it's not so. No point dwelling on it. We'll just enjoy this dram uh, while we have it. Now, one other thing that we've not done for a while, and I, I jokingly said this to Kurt earlier, um, we're ending with a Port Ellen. And uh, that's something we used to do a lot. Um, I was always a huge fan of Port Ellen. There used to be, you know, seemingly endless independent bottlings of Port Ellen uh, 10, 12 years ago. Kurt's got more than a few of them uh, behind you there, just, just to make you feel envious. Um, I, I don't like, I don't like showing such things off on camera, partly because I don't want people to come looking for them. Um, although I think your collection of Port Allen might be a bit more extensive than mine, Kurt. Nevertheless, at one point, like we, we had Port Allen's for 150, $180 a ball. I know that sounds insane today. Um, I would buy every single Port Ellen that showed up in the market. We used to get a ton of them from Douglas Lang. I would say we got about 10 different Douglas Lang single cast of Port Ellen a year for a very long time. And uh, we knew that that wouldn't last forever. It was a closed distillery. But I think that period from when Port Ellen started to increase in price to when things went crazy was very quick. It was about a three to four year expanse of time and it was an exponential growth curve and since then we've we only see maybe one to three releases of port allen a year now uh coming into the shop uh unfortunately diageo doesn't play nice with small retailers like us so um also they're not particularly good at you know serving the premium whiskey end of the market in Canada. So a lot of those releases never make it here from the official bottling standpoint. But even the independent bottling ones now, we might ask for, for nine bottles or 12 bottles of something. And sometimes we might just get three because that's all they're willing to sell or that's all they're willing to allocate to the market. So that is the case with uh, this next one we're trying here, the XOP Port Allen 35. Um, this is a uh, 1983 distillation of Port Ellen, which is the last year the distillery produced. And Kurt, for the uh, elucidation of others, um, what month did Port Ellen stop, stop distilling in? May. It, is it May? I thought it was March, but it's May. you may be right on that. Regardless, um, this particular one is from March, which would make it one of the last casks filled at the distillery. Um, and this is a period, you know, some people might wonder why did Port Allen close? Why are they reopening it? Uh, all good questions. But unfortunately in the late seventies, they were producing way too much whiskey. They'd opened too many new distilleries. They'd increased production too much. 
and there was what was known as the lock of whiskey, the lake of whiskey, and it was feared this lock lake would never be drained because it was so vast. And, and it turns out in retrospect, that was foolish. If you give enough people with good palates time, they will purchase and drink or hoard um, that surplus of whiskey that was kicking around. But Port Ellen was shut down in 1983 because Diageo already owned two other distilleries on Isla. Uh, they owned Lagavulin and Kalila and Port Ellen was surplus to their needs. So they shut it down. Um, it was really only in about the early 2000s that I think the, the interest in Port Ellen really started to take off. Um, there was a little bit in the late, the late 90s, but it was really the, the 2000s when Port Ellen sort of shot to fame, by which time it had been closed for, for two and a half decades. And, you know, there was a de decreasing amount of this available on the market. I just scoured my shelves, Andrew. I've got probably almost 40 different Port Ellens. And I don't have anything beyond March. I'm wondering if you're right. But I, yeah. I swear my, there was a German gentleman named Holger Dreyer who wrote a book on Port Ellen, a hardcover book, incredible book actually for having some neat photos and stuff. Um, I, I thought he said it trickled into as far as May, but I'm gonna double check that and I'll let you know. But proof is in the pudding and it looks like I don't have anything beyond March. Well. You know, we do have some people on this uh, chat that I know are particularly good um, fact checkers. Love so it. maybe there'll be, maybe someone will dig that up. I I'm not going to lie. I also opened up um, my second favorite resource uh, for whiskey facts to see if they had anything on there, which is scotchwhiskey.com, which unfortunately itself is now closed. But I believe, I don't know if it was Sikinder Singh from the Whiskey Exchange actually um uh, purchased or is at least purchased the information from it just to keep it up but it is still up um and i'm looking on their site and it does mention closing in 83 but they don't mention the month so um i guess we'll have to uh we'll have to figure that out at a later date another tasting with another port allen yeah have we'll have to there's another one in the cabinet that you were saying you really want to yeah. well if we can get enough people to contribute $250 a person to open that 40 year old Port Ellen. We'll do it. And then we can find some other whiskeys. Like it could literally be some bog standard stuff just to round out the range so we can all try Port Ellen. Um, I'm game for that if other people are. Six drams of Johnny Walker Red and <laughs> Port Ellen. <laughs> close it out. <laughs> yeah. Um, Danny and Lorraine, by the looks of things, are in on this. Um, and Sky. So we've got a few people who are already in. You know, that in a way could be a very funny tasting. <laughs> like literally just put on a rando tasting for the sole purpose of opening one bottle that is completely out of league of everything else you're, you're featuring. You know what? We might just run with that. Watch this space. Love it. <laughs> All right. Kurt, Port Ellen. Let's talk. Ooh. I, you know, the nose, I wasn't getting a ton off the nose like there were some nice notes in there so i just took a sip of it and it's very relaxing it's very calming i always feel pretty zen drinking port allen <laughs> that's a good thing no you're right the nose is actually a little bit shy for the port allen style which is typically that um that tarry note that citric note that herbal note um lemongrass almost in the kalila vein kind of um it was a little shy on the nose, but the palate is 100% Port Ellen. Oh yeah, the palate is is stunning. It's, you know, that gentle oily peat, as you said, lemon, like lemon oil. Um, uh, yeah, it's very expressive, very fruity. The smoke and the peat are, have been softened so much um, by the time in cask. It's just, it's delicate. And I think this is what I love about Port Ellen. I mean, for the most part, Every Port Ellen I've had has been, I've tried a few younger ones, um, but the vast majority of the Port Ellens I've had have been 20, 25 or more years of age. And that time, I think that's one of the reasons why people love Port Ellen so much is that they're getting a peated whiskey after a couple of decades and time to allow it to soften up and become more complex. And, um, you know, maybe if we had more access to other peated malts from Isla, from refill casks, which a lot of the Port Ellens are, 
at 20 to 35 years of age, we'd all be ooing and aahing more about, yeah. you know, old Kalila, about old, you know, Lef like Lefroig. I mean, granted, we've had quite a few 25 year old Lefroigs, um, but I mean, we've not had a lot of lag of Ulan at this age. No. No, I know we did, um, we did a tasting for my old club, the Drama Initiative, of 30 year old Kalilas, like all old Kalilas. Um, and they gave, give or take, a year or two on either side kind of thing. Um, and that tasting, there was a few of them in there that you would have blindly probably thought were Port Ellen. Mm -hmm. they're, they're really that close in this story. But you're, you're right. I wrote an article on it years ago. Um, it's unfair the pedestal that Port Ellen has put on, to be honest. In all fairness, what we know of Port Ellen is, as you said, all these crazy mature whiskeys. If we got to try Port Ellen, but there was a question in the comments there, how did this close? If we got to try Port Ellen at 10 years old, 12 years old, in crappy casks, given no love, not being allowed to go two and a half decades in second and third fill casks, maybe we'd be like, yeah, this distillery probably should have shut down. It's that it was allowed to mature so long. And think of how many other distilleries, if you left them, as you said, Kalilas or Magdalene's or whatever, even unpeated stuff, leave it for 30 years and everybody's going to sit back and be an all over it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, you'll also be happy to know that Benoit has fact-checked this for us, and it was May of 1983, Kurt. So, a little, little pat on the back there for you um, on the details. Maybe in my head, I just assumed it was March because I've never seen a cask after March of 83, but that's just a guess. Wow. So that was a pretty awesome lineup so far. Um, I think, you know, what we might want to do is um, have a vote. Should we have a vote? I might need a couple of minutes to tee up a vote here so that we can ask the question, what was your favorite whiskey in tonight's lineup? And then typically when we do that, we will actually do a second question um, where we get to ask you, what's your second favorite whiskey? And uh, the reason we love doing this is we just kind of like to see what other people's thoughts are. So, Kurt, if you could entertain our friends here for a minute or two while I get this lined up, that would be great. Maybe tell them about what's new and exciting. We've got a ton of boutique whiskeys in that mm -hmm. I think uh, we need to give some love to because there is some cool stuff there. I'm glad you segged into uh, tell them what we've got new and exciting because when it was entertaining, I was like, damn, my guitar's upstairs and that means I'm going to have to start taking my clothes off or something. So this is a much safer option. Uh, the boutique stuff, as Andrew said, is really, really rad. Um, I think we've got eight, 18 of them now, Andrew. Yeah. 18 different boutique whiskeys. They're the 500 mil bottles, which kind of irks me a little bit. But the prices this time seem lower. For some reason, they seem a hell of a lot better than what they did when we got previous batches years ago. Um, and in this range, I know some of you guys are the finger to the pulse kind of people. Surge lit the world on fire you know, a year or two back, starting on a, a series of Ben Nevis reviews and stuff. And everybody now realizes just how incredible Ben Nevis is. There's two Ben Nevises in this boutique range that we have in store already. There's a Capradonic, like a closed distillery. Um, there's a Lockendall from Brook Lottie that you just never see. They never released it as a commercial range. Like there's a super, super cool range, an older Glen Goyne. And, uh, I think Andrew kind of alluded to it earlier, or maybe it's just conversations he and I have been having. The, uh, the hours kind of blurred together lately. Um, this is only part of what is coming in from Boutique. Uh, we had a couple orders come, and uh, the other one just cleared as well, I think. So a couple more weeks, and we'll bring through another huge run of them. But uh, this, if the second run is anything like this first one, man, Terry was run off her feet for the latter part of the day, grabbing bottles off the shelves. You better move quick. After Andrew's email went out, they were like lying out of there. Yeah. Well, I mean, we've there's some stuff in there that we need to try because there's just not enough information out there about it. But for those who aren't familiar, the labels are cool. There's usually an inside story or joke um, tied into them. Um, one other little nugget I'll share is we actually have our own bespoke boutique bottling coming this fall or next winter, depending on... Shipping is chaos right now, which is partly why we had both these orders arrive three weeks apart when they should have been four months apart. But we won't go on and on about that. But 
Suffice to say, we have a Kleinlisch that can't be named coming from them with a label that features Sam Simmons and I, um, formerly the Balvenie Global Brand Ambassador, um, urinating on a famous monument in Scotland. Um, and you might be wondering, why would we do that? Um, there's a lot of good reasons and there's a good story behind it. And when that whiskey comes out, we'll tell you the story because this guy's monument deserves to be urinated on if anyone's does. Um, and uh, there's a personal family connection to me there too. So th th it's a really cool whiskey company. They don't do single casks. They do small batch bottlings. And really, I think what they're doing with these is because they do a lot of different batches. They're effectively blending interesting small batch releases rather than just bottling one cask that they think is good. And it's a very different approach to independent bottlings, but I, I wrote up tasting notes on three of them today. They were all great. Um, the Ben Nevis was good, but the tea and Innick and the, the, the blended malt teaspooned Balvini was stunning. There's an 18 year old blended malt and it's $135. It's just delightful. Um, so there's some other cool stuff, including a three-year-old rye matured in Oloroso Sherry like that might to you sound bonkers. Like, why would that be good? We poured it as part of some tastings we did with the boutique guys over the winter and it was a huge hit. Um, so there's some really cool stuff coming there. And uh, yeah, we'll be uh, sharing more on that as the time comes, but I promised to vote. And before we start losing too many people here, I'm gonna give you all a chance to vote for your favorite whiskey of the night. We will circle back on this again and do second favorite so um, curious to see where the votes lie here. Um, and then, you know, Kurt and I'll kind of give you our thoughts on this. And I actually, there's been too many good ones tonight for me to just go off the top of my head here. But uh, we'll try to hold that in, Kurt, so we can get everyone to give us their two cents before we share ours. Mine's working off that, you know that, right? Yeah, I already know what your favorite is. I don't think you need to tell me. No, I just meant my opinion. Oh. Give you the two cents, it's worth half that. Well, I mean, that's kind of hard to pay for now because there's not even pennies. I know. So I have to give you five of my thoughts, which is like torture. <laughs> the nose on that Port Ellen is starting to open up a little bit more. I mean, Christ, it's been in the glass an hour and a half. Like, how long does it need to, to open up? Um, so for those who haven't figured out, and unfortunately, if there's two of you, you, you only get one vote if you're sharing a, a feed tonight, but uh, there's still six votes outstanding. We're going to give you 30 seconds to vote for your first favorite, and then we're going to move on to second favorites. But right now, it looks like the Port Allen has got an, a somewhat commanding lead. Um, after, you know, the Glen Rothes is a close second, and then the gap widens. And I have to say, Kurt, just going back, the, the nose on that Glenrothes is, I mean, it's everything you want a 30-year-old sherried whiskey to be. The palate, I think, arrives a little bit dry and kind of chocolatey for me, but then the mid-palate explodes in more fruit. And so, you know, I, I love it. Great style. Good old school sherry. You know what we're going to need to tee up for future tastings like this? Because, and again, this is one last thing I'll say um, before sample. we... Well, we need the Jeopardy theme song for when we're counting down yes. the amount of time people have to submit their votes. I think it would just be a nice little touch to add that in there, as long as they don't sue us. As well um, as being a hurry up, right? <laughs> that's right. Okay, so here are the results. Um, I'm going to share them now. Um, so the Port Ellen somewhat stole the show along with the Glen Rothis for round one. Round two, I think this is usually where we see the more interesting results. Um, so this is for your second favorite whiskey of the night. I'm always, I'm often, like I often know where the first favorite is going and I was right. I thought it was gonna be the Port Ellen or the Glen Rothes. Um, and that's exactly where it went, but I, I'm really interested to see where the second favorite lands tonight. That grain, like, man, I went back to that and had another sip of it. Beautiful old grain, shows really, really well. Um, a few of you who voted the first time around can still vote. So I don't wanna end that. Maybe while you're trying to figure out, um, those of you trying to figure out how to vote, I will share quickly. We have a handful more tastings coming up before the fall. 
we're, we're taking a pause in August because we've been doing a ton of tastings, um, frankly, since January, since we finally got the permission from the Alberta Liquor and Gaming Commission to, to start filling samples and putting on tastings. But coming up uh, next Thursday, stumbling blindly into some exciting new whiskeys. This is our first blind tasting in a while, and it's our first truly blind um, virtual tasting. We've done some for the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society, but we usually give them some details. This one's completely blind. We have seven whiskeys um, aged up to 27 years of age. It's a cool range. There's still seven spots left for that. That's next Thursday, $40 uh, to register. Um, the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society virtual outturn tasting is coming up August 5th. And then Evan's got a bourbon tasting on August 12th. Oh, that jumped ahead there. There is one other tasting that we're gonna be putting on on August 20th. Some of you may know, we just got in a fabulous new cask from the Teeling Distillery um, an Armagnac, uh, either matured or partially matured or finished cask, one of those three, um, but it is lovely. And we are gonna be lucky to be joined by Alex Chasco, who is the master distiller from uh, uh, Teeling. And he's gonna be joining us on, I believe it's Friday, August 20th. That should be up on the website in the next couple of days. Jeff is correct. There is a Teeling tasting coming or a, a Kilholman tasting coming up, but I didn't mention it because it is sold out. There are unfortunately um, no other um, uh, spots available for that one. We don't have any samples left. And Paul is getting worried. His Czech liver light just went on. So uh, that's, uh, that's something to keep an eye on, Paul. Make sure you put a lot of water through it. All right, I'm gonna end the polling on second favorite whiskeys. And this, this is interesting. The Rosebank surges to a very prominent um, and strong uh, second place in the voting. Um, sharing the results there, I just realized I hadn't done that initially. Kurt, what were your favorites tonight? Your conversation in your beautiful eyes, Andrew. Uh, uh, you, know how to, you know how to charm me, Kurt. Um, no, you know me. I'm a I'm a Port Ellen junkie. Um, I thought it was a great outing for Port Ellen too. Uh, it's not super typical on the nose, but it is typical enough that I like it a lot. And the palate is just, man, that takes me back to a lot of early years and a lot of great experiences with Port Ellen. So I get a little bit sentimental with that distillery and the history and everything that everything that goes with Port Ellen. So that was my number one. It was probably going to be no matter what. I hate to admit that kind of bias. But the Rosebank just absolutely wowed me tonight. I loved it. And if I had to go with three, I know it's probably a little bit of an oddball for some people, but I'd probably want the Johnny Walker. Yeah. Those are, you know, to an extent, I think I'm on the same page with you. Slight tweaks. Um, I think just for, I, I, was, I was expecting to be disappointed by the Rosebank, even though I'd seen reviews and the reviews were all quite favorable. Um, I've always had this theory that Rosebank just, it does one, I, I actually believe it, that it doesn't mature well past a certain age. I suppose the caveat to that is if it's in predominantly refill casks, then that buys it a bit more time, but it's such a light, delicate spirit that putting it in a barrel for 30 years, just to me, seems like you're asking for it to kind of get tired and old. Yeah. Um, so I actually would have to say that's my favorite tonight because it was a surprise. I mean, the, the Port Ellen was great. Um, I, you know, it's it's a an excellent Port Ellen, but I've had a lot of excellent Port Ellens. Um, I haven't had a lot of excellent Rosebanks, especially recently. And I think for that reason, I, I have to give it a bit of a nudge above the Port Ellen. Yeah. And I, I agree, like the, the, the Johnny Walker Bicentenary bottle, it's very well put together. So it's kind of hard to to not give that uh, give that a nod, but everything else in the lineup, I think, stood up. Um, you know that that North of Scotland grain. I mean, in a malt tasting with whiskeys this old, that a grain actually has some complexity and some delicacy and can fit into the range is really cool. The T and Enic was 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 fun. It was interesting. The Aaron Twenty Five, I think, was probably maybe the weakest in the range, but still a good whiskey. I mean in an average tasting that would be a knockout bottling it's just in this company it's kind of hard to to stand on its feet yeah i like that i think it was sky certain chats just scrolled by uh said uh something about 
drinking history or something. Um, that's something we talk about all the time, right? Some of these bottles are pieces of liquid history at this point. And that's why I over sentimentalize some of the most closed distilleries and stuff. As Andrew said, Rosebank, Port Ellen, they're reopening. So they're coming back to lay. But either way, you know, we get sentimental about old blends and old bottlings too. This is from a period in those distilleries history that's long gone and it's probably never going to be replicated from a great era. So I love when you can sit down and drink something that is a historical type bottling. Um, mm. You know, people would go absolutely crazy to be able to have tried it and collectors would go batshit for it. And that bottle got opened and poured for 45 people or whatever it was. That's awesome. To me. I love it. Yeah. Well, um, I, I'm going to echo a lot of your sentiments there, Kirk. Uh, it, I love doing tastings like this. Um, even when I know that even personally, I'm not likely to buy many of these bottles because either there's not enough left or I just, I personally sometimes struggle with it because I've been collecting whiskeys for almost 20 years. And um, I, I'm, I'm punished by the fact I remember back when some of these whiskeys would have cost $120 or $180. And those things don't even seem real anymore. But this is the favorite part of it. Like, I mean, it's cool to get nice whiskeys in the shop and sell them. It's way more fun to crack them open and talk about them and enjoy them with other people. And so I, I think a big thank you to everybody who took part in tonight's tasting because this was not an inexpensive tasting. I mean, I'm sure for some of you, this was a, you know, a bit of a gamble. Maybe you've not done a higher end tasting like this before. Um, but it's something we've done for a long time in the shop because for us, as much as it's a job, or in, in my case, a business, um, it's also my passion and it's something I want to enjoy. And I'm going to enjoy it most when I get chances to try things and when I get a chance to open things. And, and uh, so this was awesome. So a big thank you to everybody who bought a ticket to this tonight or who bought one for a friend and invited them to join as well and for tuning in. Uh, because that's the last bit of this too. I know um, some of our friends, like our friend Terry Lamb, also in Vancouver, who had a ticket for this, but work got in the way and her plane just landed. She's going to watch this on Facebook later, which, which is fine, but that it's not just about getting the samples of the bottle and drinking them by yourself, but it's about enjoying them with others. And, um, you know, certainly that's something we really enjoy. And one of the cool things that hopefully will um, start happening in the shop is we haven't been pouring samples in store for people. And um, we're going to start doing that again in the next few days. Um, we're, we're not going to be doing in-store tastings again until probably February, no, not because of COVID, but just because we simply can't give up our tasting room. It is a logistics hub right now and a workspace, and it would be very difficult to, to sacrifice that space, but that'll happen eventually too. But until then, and even after then, we're going to keep doing these virtual tastings because it allows us to connect with people in places where maybe they can't make it to the shop for the event. And, uh, we, we, we kind of love that and we we love that bit of community too so thank you everyone for tuning in tonight um thank you for all the the comments and compliments on the tasting i hope you really enjoyed it um this for me was an incredible range it's it's definitely one of my highlight tastings of the year and we've had some really cool tastings over the last seven months uh, but there's more to come this fall and keep your eye out there just might be a tasting that sole purpose is to crack a bottle of Port Ellen 1979 and some other whiskeys to just round out the range to seven bottles, seven random Isla like bottles, you know, stranger things have happened. Andrew, you, so, you've never tried a 40 year old Port Ellen, have you? I, I don't want to reach that high. That'd be no, amazing. And we have one, so we probably should do it. So get it out of the inventory. Um, I just got to jump back to the comments for a sec. Somebody said something about the best tasting they've done. That's amazing. Sorry, I, I missed the name. It was scrolling. Lots of comments coming in fast and furious. Lots of them link to you saying happy birthday to Claude, who I met for the first time just a couple of days ago. And gentleman, scholar, kindred spirit, very kind soul. So that was a pleasant meeting. Uh, I love that we get to meet in person. When I get to see some of these faces on screen, it's brilliant. When I actually get to see you guys stroll into the store, it's even better. So. Happy, happy birthday, Claude. Yeah, Claude. Well, we've got a contingent from Kelowna tonight. Uh, so definitely hi to those guys. Um, incidentally, I don't know if my wife will let me come out and play, but I'm actually going to be out there next week. So send me a note. You never know. Um, I may be able to sneak away for a night and share some drams. Um, 
But I think this is as good a point as any to, uh, to call it a night. So um, thank you again, everyone, for taking part. And have a wonderful summer if we don't see you. And certainly keep an eye on our tasting schedule. If you're not signed up for the Malt Messenger, uh, make sure that you do. That's the first place you'll hear about our new tastings. We are planning to roll out um, at least September and October's program in mid, early to mid-August. So that'll be coming out soon. Um, but until then, enjoy your summer. I hope it's not too smoky where you are. And we'll talk soon. Have a good night. Thanks, Kurt. Thank you.